So let's dive into the chapter here. Verse number one. The Bible reads, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. Now, this first epistle of John that we're reading here, 1 John chapter 1, is, is penned down by the same uh, person as the Gospel of John. Okay, this is the same John. It's the same John as the book of Revelation as well. So what you're going to find here, even though everything is, the, you know, the Word of God is, the, the, the author is God. Right, this the word of God. It is God's word. That's what makes it perfect and and without error. And it truly is what God would have us to know. But the way that God works with man, as He does even with people being saved, He works with man. It's God's word that saves. It's it's God that has the power. But God endues the man to be able to. Uh, to bring forth his word and to plant the seed and to do the things that are required for salvation. And God has ordained that man is involved in that. Similarly, God has used man to deliver his word unto us. And it's not that these are just all of the thoughts and intents of the individual human being that's speaking the word of God. However, when the words are expressed, the word of God is expressed, there is there is differences or signatures of that person kind of in, and signature might not be the right word, but it's a, it's a um, style, thank you. Yeah, style that you can tell there's a, there's a little bit different. Some of the subject matters that are brought up are very similar too. And when you compare the writings of the Gospel of John with the, the writings of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Revelation, there's a lot of similarities of the, the subject matter as well as... Um, even just the words that are used. And, and this is, you know, again, it's, it's somewhat of a mystery the way that God uses man, okay? And, and the Bible tells us that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, right? But the Holy Ghost leads and provides the truth for those human vessels to speak and then be able to transmit to everybody, the word of God, okay? And I don't want to get too deep on that. Uh, we know that this is the word of God. We trust this. But the reason I'm even bringing all this up is because we're going to see a lot of similarities between John chapter 1 and 1 John chapter 1, um, talking about Jesus, specifically bringing up the, the word, right? This is something that's, that's somewhat unique to the apostle John, um, He's, he brings up that we've seen him, the word of life. And this is, these are all things that we find in John chapter 1. We're going to get there in a minute. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But what he's saying, he's opening up this book. And, and the other thing to understand before I even continue any further, when we're looking at these chapters, and this book especially, okay, the chapter divisions are great. It helps us to break things down and identify and communicate, hey, what, what are we talking about? What part of that book of the epistle, the first epistle of John, are you even talking about? Oh, it's chapter 3 and verse number 10 or whatever. You know, like you, you can reference things so that we can have a, a better discussions talking about the same thing. But the epistle is just one epistle. We're going to be looking at some passages here that he's just starting to talk about subjects in chapter 1 and going to continue to go much more in depth in chapter 2 and chapter 3 and chapter 4 and chapter 5 throughout the whole epistle. And what people who teach false doctrines will oftentimes do is go and, and, and pull out a verse and build a whole doctrine off of that verse without getting it in the proper context and the full teaching of that uh, epistle or of that book, let alone, of course, it has to, to, to coincide with the, the context of this, the Bible as a whole, right? So there can't be any contradictions in Scripture 
even throughout the epistles that Paul wrote, or the epistles that Peter wrote, or the epistles that John wrote. Like, you can't have any contradiction because it is all the Word of God. But especially, I mean, you want to understand the meaning of something, well, within that epistle, make sure you're getting the full context and the full teaching of what's being said. Because in 1 John, there's a lot of places where you can just pull one verse and be like, see, look what the Bible says right here. But you have to get the whole teaching of what does it really mean? What, why is he even saying the things that he says in this context? Okay, and, and it'll become a lot clearer as we continue through this. And there'll probably be some referring back to 1 John chapter 1 as we continue this Bible study. So um, I'm not going to be able to teach too much in depth on, on necessarily everything that's stated in 1 John chapter 1. Because it's going to be, we're going to receive more information about these things as we continue in these other chapters where we're going we're gonna to just understand it even more fully. So that being said, he starts off just saying, look, we've heard, we've seen this with our eyes, and this is the testimony of, of those that were with Christ, right? That's where our New Testament books come from. They come from people who, man, we were there. I've seen it with my eyes. I've felt it with my hands. I mean, I know this is true. I was there. I am an eyewitness. We've looked upon him. We've seen him with our eyes. Our hands have handled him. Like we've touched the word of life. For the life was manifested. It was, you know, the life was manifested in the flesh, which is what we find out from John chapter 1, when the word was made fest, flesh. And we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. And in here we see all of these words being used about Jesus. And he's using these, these words synonymously like the word of life and even that eternal life. The eternal life he's referring to is, is Jesus. And if you think about it, we get our eternal life through Christ, right? He is the truth, the way, and the life, right? So he's the life, he's the word. These words are faithful and true. Jesus Christ is called faithful and true. And there's so many aspects when you, when you read about even just the word of God and Jesus Christ, all the attributes and characteristics line up perfectly because Jesus is the word. The Bible says in Luke 24, there's a, there's a um, testimony here in the gospel of Luke about them handling Jesus, because remember he said, look, we've seen him and, and we've handled him in verse number one here in 1 John 1. Luke 24, verse 36 says this, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. So when Jesus resurrects from the dead and he's seen of his disciples, this is extremely important because this is confirming it's not, they didn't see a ghost. They didn't just see a spirit. Now look, God could have chosen to resurrect just spiritually and not physically, right? Like if that was his plan, but that wasn't his plan. But, and this is really important because there's so much tied into the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ that he came back, not just like in the spirit. And there's plenty of false religions out there that will teach things like this, that it's just a spiritual resurrection or things like that. No, Jesus is like, look, I'm here. I'm not just an apparition. I'm not just a spirit. I'm not just some ghost. Uh, I, I'm, I mean, I, I have flesh and bones. Touch me, handle me, feel me like it's me. Here's my hand. And he says, why did he show him his hands and his feet? Because he had nails pounded into his hands and his feet. That's why. He's, it's not because of any other reason other than to be like, it's me. Remember, <laughs> I, got, I got nails pierced through my hands. See, do you see where they, where they pierced the nails through my hands and through my feet? I'm back. I'm resurrected. I'm here. I'm alive. And that is, um, that's extremely important. Of course, the resurrection is, is, is critical to our salvation, to the hope that we have that Jesus Christ did not just die, but he died and rose again from the dead. 
We have a living Savior. And this is what uh, the Apostle John is expressing here, even just in these first a uh, couple of verses in 1 John chapter 1, like, look, we've seen him. We've taught, we know that this is true. So he's, he's giving the, the reason to, you know, just, just opening up with, with his testimony and, and the confidence that, yes, this is absolutely true. What we're going to tell you about is what we have seen and what we have heard. He's called also here the, uh, the word of life. The Bible says in John 6, 51, where Jesus said this, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And, and obviously he didn't call himself the word of life, but he called himself the living bread. And the fact that Jesus Christ has life, is life, and provides life is what's being um, taught here in 1 John chapter 1. He's the word of life. He's the bread of life. He provides life to all who receive him. John eleven twenty five 25 says this, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Jesus Christ is the life, John 14, verse 6, of course, I already quoted this earlier. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And John is now bearing witness of the life. This is the word of life. This is the life that was manifested. This is that eternal life that we are going to teach and preach unto you as he's writing this epistle uh, just, just bearing witness to life, to eternal life. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 1. Keep your place in 1 John 1 because we are coming right back to that. In John chapter 1, of course, the Apostle John refers to Jesus as the Word again in, this, uh, in the Gospel here. John 1.1, 1, 1, the Bible reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. In this verse, very clearly, as with 1 John, we'll see, and especially as we get into 1 John chapter 5, teaches the Trinity, the doctrine that we believe in the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and that these three are one. We'll go into that much more deeply when we get into chapter 5. But we see here also John 1.1 1, 1 is a great place to show the deity of Jesus Christ. And the fact that it says here that he's with God, but he also was God. So this, this is the concept of the three in one. There's a separation of there being three, but then there's a unity of there being one. He's with God because he's with the Father, but he is God, and that's why it says he, and, and he was, the word was God. Okay, one God, three persons. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that doctrine this morning, as I said, but we see the similarities here between uh, these passages, and that's one of the things I want to point out. So he talks about the Word, the Word is with God, the Word was God. Verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And, and before I continue, I just want to point this out. Like, some people, the naysayers and atheists and people want to criticize the Bible, a lot of, a lot of times people will claim that, oh yeah, this, this whole religion about Jesus just came up like after he died, and that's not really what Jesus was teaching, but like his disciples just took things really far and they just kind of built up this whole religion after him and, and turned it into something that it wasn't when Jesus was around. You know, people will make up all kinds of stories to try to just cast shade on the Bible and why you shouldn't believe it. Oh, it's just these men that made this up. But look, the Gospel of John... It, it, clearly John believes this, but it's clear also that Jesus taught this because he's quoting Jesus Christ in his teachings. And it's like, look, these are the guys that were with him. They know what Jesus was teaching. And, and think about that too. Like, like what a better witness. I've witnessed this just personally in my own life with people who preach the Bible. 
you'll, you know, there's some people who might hear things that are taught. They'll hear little, little snippets and they'll, and they'll, they'll hear this or that or something. They'll hear through the grapevine, maybe through someone said. And then a lot of times people like to just make things up <laughs> or, or extrapolate and then just start making all this other judgment on that person. Then what is even true? But those who are actually there and are actually eyewitnesses and are actually part of that minute, you know, you know much more fully what's true than those who just are kind of on the outside and they hear something here and there. And this is common, especially within the new IV movement. There's so many people online, on the internet, they live all over the world. They just kind of hear different things. They might hear a sermon here or hear this other thing there or read something, some post or some blog or some news article or, or whatever and think they know the whole story. It's like you don't know it at all. Like, why don't you find out from the people who are actually there and eyewitnesses and, and are involved what the truth actually is? And if you're interested in the truth, that's what you'll do, right? And not just believe everything you, you, you hear or see from other people, just as uh, people trying to cast shade on, like, oh, well, Jesus didn't say, like, no, he did. And that's why, like, all of his disciples and his apostles are saying, this is what he taught. And they all believe this and were willing to die for it. They didn't have some advantage. They weren't trying to milk people for their money. They, they were martyred. I mean, they lost their lives for the cause of Christ. Their life was not bettered, physically speaking, by serving Christ and making the claim that he was God. Like, what is the motivation for these men when you know how their life was lived and we have a record of what happened to them and the persecution that they faced and the, the being ostracized by the world at large? And even like the Apostle Paul is writing about all the things he went through. Like, look, I was shipwrecked. I was in perils among false brethren. I was in perils in the sea. And, you know, like, like all of the things that he went through. Why? It was all for the cause of Christ and just preaching this truth. He wasn't getting financial gain. He was working as well as ministering the word. You know, he, this should show you that it's not about uh, us, any other motivation than these people fully, completely believed all of this stuff to be true. So people want to try to tell you otherwise, that's just false. I mean, this is a, a powerful witness coming from the people who were with Christ. They handled him. They ate with him. They were, were taught directly by him and know what was being said and what was being taught and then continued with those teachings and continued um, to, to bring forth that truth. Let's go back to John chapter 1 here. The Bible says in verse number 4, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So again, in, in Christ, in Jesus, in the word, was life. Jesus is the life. And the light, and, and he references the life was the light of men and talks about the light, which we're also going to see reference in 1 John chapter 1 as well. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness. And this isn't the apostle John. It's talking about John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And then verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Uh, let's go back to 1 John chapter 1. Verse number three. So as we continue through here, and you'll see more similarities, of course, as we continue. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So one of the things that he's uh, stating here, he says, look, we're the, the things that we've heard and seen, we declare unto you. He's making a declaration. This is a statement of truth. He's saying, we're going to declare these things unto you. This is what we've seen and this is what we've heard. Now I'm declaring it unto you. 
and say he's declaring unto you like this is this is powerful this is there's no doubt about this these are the things we've seen and heard we know these things to be true so we're going to declare this unto you and what's the the purpose of that why that you can have fellowship with us they already have had the fellowship with christ they already have the fellowship with the father they know what they're teaching is true they know they've received the word of god and now we're saying, look, we're declaring this unto you. You can, you can have fellowship with us. We want you to know this stuff too. We want you to see and hear the things that we've seen, you know, to at least know the things that we've seen and heard so that you can have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And when he's talking about declaring these things unto you, uh, it reminded me of, of Acts 4.20 that says, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And this is, of course, when, when the apostles were being, were being persecuted for preaching Jesus, and they're they trying to command them not to teach in his name, and if you do this, you're going to get arrested, and we're going to beat you, and all these other things. And they're like, look, he's like, whether, whether it's right, you know, you, you decide that. And again, I'm not quoting that right at all, but he's saying, you know, they said, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Like, we can't help it. So if it's, if it's right by you for us, you, you, if you think it's right for us to censor God's word and when God tells us to, commands us to teach and you tell us not to, look, we're going to obey God rather than men. That was their attitude. We're not going to just listen to what you have to say. We're going to do what God told us to do. So we can't help but to speak these things. And, you know, we all ought to have that attitude. The things that you've learned from the Bible, things that, that God has opened up your understanding about and the truth that you know, all of us have, you know, if you're here and you're saved today, you have that understanding of being saved in the gift of eternal life. You know, hopefully you have that same spirit that says, I can't help but talk about these things. I can't help but just preach this truth unto people because it's so important because I know this to be true. I know that God is true. I know the Bible is true. I know that heaven is real. I know that hell is real. And I know that there's a free gift that God loves you and he wants you to be saved. I know this and I can't help but tell you about it. Amen. And this is how all the disciples were. We can't even help ourselves. I have to tell you about this. This is like the burning in the bosom where it's like, look, I don't even want to say anything. Was it Jeremiah that said that was like, hey, I don't want to, you know, I, I tried not to say anything. I just shut up my mouth because there's all these naysayers around. There's all these people that are after him. But I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I had this burning. And, and you have to, to speak, preach the truth. Cannot help. I cannot but speak the things we've seen and heard. And this is what John is testifying here in 1 John uh, chapter 1. We're declaring these things unto you because we want you to have fellowship. Verse number 4, 1 John 1. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Now, the these things is not just referring to chapter 1, of course, but it's referring to this whole epistle. So these things we're writing unto you that your joy may be full. So we're going to have to keep that in mind as we continue. Because as you read through the book of 1 John, you're going to find a lot of references to loving not the world, right? Into, into, into living righteously and holy. And the reason why he brings this stuff up, and like I said, we're, we're going to go into that as we continue our Bible study. But just keep this in mind that these things are written that your joy may be full. So the whole point of talking about some of these things that some people might consider to be negative things is really to bring joy to you. And it, it, keep your place here in 1 John. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 15. Because we see the same concept taught there as well. So there's two reasons that we saw in 1 John, verses 3 and 4, that we just read of why he's declaring these things unto you. One, that you can have fellowship with us. And then by association, he says, well, hey, our fellowship with the Father. So if you're going to have fellowship with us, then that is, means you're also going to have the fellowship with the Father as well. And then also that your joy may be full. Right? And why wouldn't it be? If you have fellowship with the Father, it stands to reason that, of course, that would also bring you joy. Right? Fellowship with other, with other brethren and fellowship with the Father. There's joy in that. 
and he's saying, hey, we're writing these things on you because we want you to have fellowship. We want your joy to be full. John 15, verse number 9, the Bible reads, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Of course, this is Jesus speaking. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. So Jesus is talking about their joy being full, but what did he say right before that? If you keep my commandments, you're going to abide. You're going to be dwelling in my love. And dwelling in the love of Christ is going to bring you joy. But how are you going to have that joy? By keeping the commandments. Oh, you're so legalistic. <laughs> Look, I teach the Bible and I'm going to teach keeping the commandments of Christ because I want you to have joy in your life. You know who doesn't have joy in their life? Those that want to mock, say, ah, you're so legalistic. They don't have joy in their life. Oh, you follow all these rules. Yeah, and, and you don't follow the rules and tell me how that's working out for you. You don't want to hear about uh, the prohibition of alcohol and God's word. You want to just go out and drink and, and party it up. and have, Yeah, tell me how good that works out for you. How fun is that hangover? How's that, how's that liver disease treating you? How, how are all the dumb things that you say and do feeling the next day? It's not very, it's not full of joy. You have the fool's joy for the moment when you're drinking and doing drugs, but you pay for it a lot more later. And, and it really, whatever you think you're feeling of, of that good feeling that comes with the, the alteration of your senses through drugs and, and alcohol, it's a lot worse in the end. The withdrawal, the, the, the impact on your body, because there's, there is a certain feeling that those poisons bring to your body that make you feel good, that make your body give you that sense of pleasure. Look, I'm not going to lie and say that there isn't some type of pleasure in doing these things. Otherwise, no one would do it. Of course it's there. That's the draw. That's the appeal. But the effect, the, the after effect is much worse on your body than whatever effect that you feel in the moment of getting that carnal uh, pleasure feeling that goes on. I mean, fornication is very similar, right? There's a carnal feeling of pleasure, but then the ramifications of that sin far outweigh any, any momentary pleasure that you get. It's just like Moses, you know, he, he, he forsook the pleasures of sin for a season because the pleasures of sin, they don't last long. That's very, very, very temporary and always come with a consequence. So we don't look at the people who are living riotous lives and indulging in the, the, you know, the women and the, the fast life and the party and stuff. They don't have joy. They don't. It's not true joy. It, it's a facade. It looks, it looks exciting and it looks fun on the outside. But then once people get in that, I mean, that's why it's full of divorce, depression, death. I mean, all the people that, that get involved in that, it's very rare that they come out of it living to any length of time. And those that do look like they're dead. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at some of these ancient rock stars that, that still have survived somehow. They look like they're dead. <laughs> like anyone who's still alive, like Rolling Stones or any of these other, you know, like that were known for, for the, the, the drugs and the booze and stuff, you don't know want to look like that when you get to their age at all. And I guarantee you, no matter what they look like, they're feeling it. So they're, they're not, you know, that's not a life of joy. And people who just sow to the flesh, you're going you're gonna to reap the consequences of that. You're going to reap death. You sow to the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. Sowing to the flesh is not a good idea. Um, so yeah, your joy being full, keeping God's commandments. Because at the end of the day, God 
knows what's good for you. It, look, we're going to see here, God is light. God is love. We're going to find all these things. You see all these things in 1 John? God is love. And that's a true statement. And amen. I mean, thank God for his mercy and for saving us. And we're sinners and we don't deserve it, but he loved us anyways. Such a loving God has told us how we ought to live. He's instructed us. He tells us, look, live this way. Not because he hates you. Just as much as a mom and a dad raising children, you know, how many times the children complain, oh, why can't I do this? Oh, you know, you, know, you hate me. That's something we've heard from, from our youngest recently is, you know, we tell her not to do something. You hate me. <laughs> right? And look, that's a child's mentality. And for adults, it's kind of funny, right? We know, and it's not like they even believe that, they just say these things, but it, that, that thought comes into the head of the immature, the babe. Oh, you're not, you're being real restrictive and not letting me do this because you hate me. No, no, that's not it at all. And one day when you grow up more, you'll understand it's not because we hate you. It's, it's, it's the exact opposite. It's because we love you. And we need to understand that about the Bible, the rules, the commandments that Christ has in here. It's not because God hates you and he wants you to live such a, a stuffy, prudish life and you can't have any fun. And it's like, that's not it at all. There's, <laughs> you, you, and you won't know it until you do it, until you try it. The joy that comes with living a righteous life. The closer you are to Christ, the, the more you can incorporate. And look, none of us are perfect. We know that, but we don't, it doesn't mean, well, let's just throw up our hands and give up then because we're not perfect. So let's just indulge in all manner of sin. No. One of the reasons why we don't just always have joy in life because we're not always walking in the spirit, right? We have these, we have areas that need to be improved on. But the more you walk in the spirit, the more joy you're going to have. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. When you walk in the Spirit, when you're, when you're obeying the commandments of Jesus, when you're doing what's right, the joy is there. John 15, Jesus taught this. John, 1 John, the Apostle John is reiterating this. Um, that, look, we want your joy to be full. Let's look at verse number 5, 1 John chapter 1. The Bible says, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And this is another good attribute of God, the true God, that in God it, there, there's, it's only light and no darkness at all. And when you compare the God of the Bible to other religions and other gods of the world, this isn't the truth in many other religions. You think about it, especially like the, the Eastern religions and a lot of Asian religions, you know, the, the, the yin yang mm -hmm. sign. Many of you may have seen that before. It's like a, a white and a black and there's like a dot in the white section and uh, of black and then a dot of white in the black section. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. The circle. Okay. Maybe you're familiar with that. And what that represents is that in, in good, there's always a little evil and in evil, there's always a little good. Right? And, and it, they're just trying to say that this is, and, and in one sense, right, in a carnal sense, you get, when you're applying that to people, you can say, oh, yeah, sure. I mean, people who are evil can end up doing something that's good, and people who are good can do some things that are evil, right? But that's not God, <laughs> right? That is not God, and that is not some way we should follow like of, of this, you know, doing any evil because in, in God is just light. So if you're going to put a representation of God, it would just be like all light. Zero darkness whatsoever because God is light. And, and I love, I mean, just think, of, it, it's so profound. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just think about your own. Just what light does. Light exposes things. Darkness hides things. Light Everything's open, everything's seen. Evil things are always done in the dark, undercover. People don't want to be known. They don't want to be found out. In all manner of life everywhere, people who are doing things they shouldn't be doing don't want to be seen, don't want to be caught, don't want it to be made known. 
And when people are doing what's right, who cares? Yeah, let's, let's publish it abroad, above board, right? We ought to shine the light, and the light shines into the darkness. And, you know, the, John chapter 1 talks about this as well, that light was, uh, the light shineth in the darkness. And I'll just read this for you from John chapter 1. And the darkness comprehended it not. Right? And Jesus is that true light. And he went out and, and why did they hate Jesus and want to destroy him? Because he exposed them and he, and he preached about them that their deeds were evil. Right? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, you know, those that were out to kill Jesus, he exposed them as hypocrites. He exposed them as false prophets. Because the truth and the light exposes those things. And that's what it's going to do and it makes people angry. The Bible says in, in John 8, 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Verse number 6 here in 1 John chapter 1, the Bible reads, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now, this is, this is going to be an important part of the, of the passage here, and we're getting into an area where People are going to formulate some false doctrine when you're not getting this in context and as a whole, and people want to yank stuff out of Scripture. But first, let's start with verse number six, because this is a true statement. Now, when we're talking about fellowship, there's nothing weird about the definition of that word. I think we all pretty much understand that, right? Fellowship. We're communing with one another. We're going to be, I mean, if you're talking about fellowship with people, you're going to be on good terms. You're going to be having communion and, and, and just a good time back and forth one with another. If I have fellowship with my children, if I have fellowship with my wife, I have fellowship with you in church, we'll be able to hang out together, spend some time together, and everything's good, right? Fellowship. This is not talking about just being saved. This is talking about having fellowship, okay? So if we say we have fellowship with God, and, and look, this is going to be real clear when you think about how many people, if you were to ask them, you know, like, well, hey, do you, you know, do you have fellowship with God, or, or how good is your, you know, a lot of people will tell you how great their relationship is with God, right? Oh, yeah, I've got a great relationship with God. And here's what the Bible's saying here. Look, if you say you have fellowship with them, but then you're walking in darkness, but then you're living this life where you're, you're involved in this sin and this sin and this sin and this sin and this sin, he says, we're lying. And we're not doing the truth. You lie and do not the truth. You can't claim to have this great fellowship with God, but you're living in fornication, you're going out and partying and drinking, you're going, you know, like, like you're just living this sinful lifestyle and be like, oh yeah, I've got this great relationship with God. No, you don't. No, you don't. I mean, it's just, just call it what it is. You don't. You're lying to yourself. You're deceiving yourself if you think you have some great relationship with God and you're not doing really anything spiritual or anything that God said. I mean, think about this. What type of relationship does a child have with their parent when a parent's telling them, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, and they don't do any of that, but then they're like, oh yeah, I got a great relationship with her. It's like, you really think that? Because mom and dad are going to be like, no. Like, they're not doing anything that I tell them to do. Or every once in a while, they might listen and do one thing. It's like, it's like I'm, calling, I'm calling my son. I keep calling you. I keep calling you. And then like one day out of the week, they're like, oh, hey, dad, how's it going? And then the rest of the time, I'm trying to speak to him, trying to get through to him, and nothing. That's not a good relationship. Like, oh, I'm just going to go off and do whatever I want. And then occasionally I'll listen or hear what you have to say. Or, yeah, I'll listen to you, but I'm not really going to do that. I'm not going to take it to heart. If we say we have fellowship and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light... We have fellowship one with another. And so look, if we're, if we're doing right, 
if we're, if we're, if we're living righteously, we're going to have good fellowship. We're going to have fellowship one with another, with other believers, and then we're also going to have fellowship with the Father. And, now, and then it says this. It says, And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now, some people will want to twist what this is saying to say, well, if you're not walking in light, then you're not saved. So, and you got to be careful with logic and, and, and how you, you can't always do the inverse or the reverse of a statement to make it true. Some truths are only one direction. There's not, not everything, you know, there's a, there's a transitive principle, you know, if A equals C and B equals C, then A equals B. But that's not what's being done here. Okay? And you have to understand that when the Bible says, um, if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. That's not saying you have to walk in the life to be saved or to be just cleansed from every sin. What this is doing is illustrating the truth that, first of all, none of us is without sin. So when he's talking about walking in light, you have to address the fact that nobody's perfect. So nobody's going to be walking in the light perfectly. I mean, we, we can't. So there's going to have to be some type of way to differentiate between walking in darkness and walking in light because anytime you sin, you're like, well, we're, we're, I'm not in light then. And, and that's true. But there's a difference between, you know, those who are just living a life of sin, as we would consider it, versus those who are, you know, of course a sinner because we fall short, but we're not just living a, a sinful life. And why the context matters so much is if you just yank out verse number seven, it's a lot easier to try to teach that, see, look, you have to be walking the light or else you don't have that, that forgiveness of sins, which is not what it's saying. But when you keep reading this epistle, look at, for example, look at uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 1. I mean, just, just a few verses later, right? This is all one epistle. We just jump down a few sentences. He says, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. So the goal is to not sin. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So the point and the goal and what's being expressed is to not sin. It's to walk in light. But if you do sin, hey, you still have an advocate, right? So if you're walking in darkness, you can't say you have fellowship with God. But if you're walking in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and, hey, the blood of Jesus Christ's Son cleanses us from all sin. So in those areas where we're going to fall short, in those areas, because we are sinners, we can still walk in the light and have the confidence of knowing, okay, when I mess up and when I slip up, I've got Christ that's going to cover me of that sin and still be able to walk in the light as he's describing it here. So, of course, we're not going to be perfect. But we can still walk in the light because we have Christ that covers us from all of our sin. Does that make sense? Like that's what's being taught here. And it's clearer because look, the only other way to take that would be to say, okay, well then I guess we have to live perfectly sinless to walk in the light. Does anyone do that? Only fools actually believe that. There are some foolish movements out there that, that actually subscribe to this. And occasionally you may run into them. Uh, the, I think the only ones that I've run into that, that really believe this are, are Pentecostals. There's like a, a holiness movement that, that believe that you can actually, they believe in what's called sinless perfection. And their definition of that is, is that they believe that it's possible to actually live in the flesh here on earth and not sin at all. For, and I'm talking about like extended periods of time. I've talked to someone who said like, yeah, I haven't sinned in like three years, maybe five years. <laughs> it's a joke, right? Yeah. It's a joke. 
It is a joke. And, and the only people who believe that are people who deceive themselves. Because no one else is deceived. If someone comes up to you like, yeah, I haven't sinned in five years. <laughs> like you try not to laugh in their face just to be nice to them because it's so ridiculous of a thing to say you haven't sinned in that long. And, and, and look, this is, it, it's so silly because you know, anyone who goes out soul winning, we talk to people, one of the first things we do is we just bring up sin and the fact that, hey, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And like 99.9% .9 of the people you talk to totally agree. Of course, because it's just so obvious. Look, we have all sinned. Of course we're not perfect. And of course, we can't even really live a perfect life. There's just too many. And, and the thing is, you're either extremely ignorant and just haven't read the Bible and you only listen to what someone else tells you about the Bible to, to, be, to be convinced that you don't sin. Like, to be convinced that you don't sin, there's a lot of sins you have to just not believe are sins. <laughs> right? So, like, you can't read Proverbs, first of all, because the, the book of Proverbs states that the thought of sin or the thought of foolishness is sin. Amen. The thought of foolishness is sin. You can't read James, right? The Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Because you mean to tell me that you are always doing that which is good? Because you know who did that? There's only one person who's ever done that, Jesus. He's the only one that could ever say, I, I do always those things that please the Father. So you're going to tell me, as you're sitting in your house, eating potato chips and watching television, like, I mean, I'm not lying. These are, like, I've had this conversation with people before. Not these exact words, but these type of people who are doing these things. Wait, do you know how to do good? Don't you know you're supposed to be preaching the gospel? Every, I mean, don't you know? Look, Jesus did always those things. Right. Now, Jesus is the one who said, I don't even have a dwelling place. Why? Because he was out all the time ministering to people. Like that was his life. Other than the necessary sleep and food for his body to be sustained, he was ministering. He was working. He was doing. Okay. That's the life that Christ led. He did always those things that pleased the Father. We can't say that in an in, in honest conscience and think that we're like, we're that. I mean, people who really think that are so full of themselves and lifted up in their pride, they're just blinded themselves. And, and, which is why this, <laughs> the passage continues to say this in verse number eight. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Look, if you think you don't have sin, you're just lying to yourself. And guess what? The truth isn't in you. And so this also shows us, look, if, you think, if you're going to go proclaim that you just have no sin, the truth isn't even in you. And, and what does it mean if the truth isn't in you? You're not saved. These people who think they just don't, don't sin at all, ever, like they're just pure, they're not saved. Otherwise, he wouldn't have made the statement that says, like, the truth is not in you. Now he says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, how do we make God a liar if we say we haven't sinned? Because as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Well, that can't be true if you've not sinned. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, that can't be true if, if you haven't sinned. For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Yet yeah, you're making God a liar. Okay, the truth isn't in you. There's a lot more that we're going to see, and especially that relate to these verses right here. Because in 1 John chapter 3, there's going to be a truth explained 
about the new man and about the spirit, about the, about the man that doesn't sin. But he's laying the foundation first to just make sure this is established as we get into this. Again, all, you have to read this all in context. It, it's, it's all important. He's laying down this, this foundation so that we can understand later when the, when the statement's made, hey, he that, what's, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. There's a, there's a, a deeper understanding to that than what is being described right here. Because he's just saying, look, if you don't have sin, the truth's not in you. If you, say, if you say that you don't have sin. So these truths need to fit together appropriately. And as we get into this chapter, like I said, we'll, we'll figure out all of that. I'll we'll preach through what, what, what it all means. But the simple portion here, look, we're all sinners. And there's no denying that. And, and if we say that we, we don't have sin, we're just deceiving ourselves. Everyone else knows that you have sin. Everyone knows. Even people who don't believe, I mean, people who don't believe the Bible at all or don't even believe God knows that no one is perfect. Nobody. We all mess up. We all make mistakes. We all do things that are wrong. And we all do things that, that are harmful, whether to ourselves or others. So don't, don't get puffed up in that, in that understanding of saying, like, oh, well, I'm so righteous. And, you know, don't ever get to that point either where, obviously, we want to strive to live in holiness and in righteousness and walk in light. That's what, what's, what the goal is all the time. But when you, when you, when you self-reflect, right, I could, pre I could stand here and preach the truth and say, hey, look, there is joy with that fellowship and, and being close to God. Because there have been times in my life where I've been really close to God, but not always, right? Because when, when the sin comes in, it kind of draws you away from God. We need to, to try to maintain that walk as much as possible in our life. But understanding this truth and knowing this truth, don't allow yourself to get this high mindset that says, well, I mean... Yeah, I'm, all, I'm pretty much always in the light and I'm always, you know, stay humble. We all have, have room to improve. Don't deceive yourself into thinking how great you are, you know, how great thou art, <laughs> when we're not that great. The Bible talk, you know, teaches all our righteousness is like filthy rags in God's eyes. We're not as holy as we'd like to think that we are, but we strive for that. And we know and have confidence there is joy in that. And we, we want to have that close relationship. We want to have that close fellowship as close as possible and have as much joy as we can in our life. We don't want to deceive ourselves into thinking, well, we're so great and we're so much better than everyone else. No. Continue to strive to, to continue to obey Christ's commandments because that's how we're going to have that joy and that's how we're going to have that good relationship. We know we're falling short, but we're going to continue to, to try to keep it every day anyways because we know that's the right way. And, we're going to, and, and we can continue, you know, even though we don't keep this perfectly as we may like to, we're going to still preach that, hey, this is still the right way. And even if someone fails you or you put confidence in someone that teaches these things and you, you go, oh, wait, but they have this. Sin. Well, you know what? This is still true. This is still true. The Bible is still the word of God. And if anyone ever fails of what the Bible teaches, even a teacher, right? If I fail you and you're like, oh man, Pastor Burzins, you know, he did this sin or that sin or whatever, you know, and, you're, and you, you, know, you just get really disappointed. Well, this still is true. And, you know, I hope I never disappoint you. But, I, but I'll tell you this right now, I'm not perfect. <laughs> I'm still a sinner like everyone else is a sinner. So if you're, if you're looking to someone expecting perfection, then, you, you, you know, I'm not Jesus. So look to Jesus for the perfection. And I'm going to preach God's word, not my word. So you can believe this because it's God's word, not because it's my word. And I'm going to do my best to follow and live my life according to this word. But 
Don't put your confidence in me or in any man, for that matter. Keep your trust in the Word of God, because that will never fail you. And you'll never be disappointed, and you'll never be let down by the Word of God. That stands sure. Men come and go. Men succeed. Men fail. But the Word of God abides forever. And Jesus Christ is perfect, and, and he is the one that's without sin. And that's why we put our focus and attention on him and learning his ways and following his commandments. And that what bring, brings us the joy and the fellowship. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for uh, this book, the uh, first epistle of, of John. Pray that you please help us to understand what's, what's taught in, uh, in your word. Open up our understanding, Lord. Give us wisdom. And um, I pray that you please bless the church this afternoon. Help us to win many people to Christ. That you'd fill us with your spirit, with your power to go out and preach your word. And I pray that you would please um, just guide us into truth. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.